two, one, record. Well, uh, hello to everyone. Good morning, good evening, <laughs> wherever you are. <laughs> good summer, good winter. <laughs> I know you guys down there, down under, are freezing. Sorry about that, uh, but that's that time of year. We're pretty much dying of heat stroke over here. Uh, it's been pretty warm, but uh, I'm thankful that we have air conditioning, unlike a lot of our friends over there in Europe. Uh, you know, so it's it's tough when it gets hot over there. Well, today we're continuing on with uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 3. And um, in the first few verses, he talks about uh, letters of re recommendation. And um, before I get into starting to read the text, I found an amusing story that uh, the title of it is Letter of Recommendation. <laughs> it has nothing to do with, <laughs> with this study, but <laughs> it's rather amusing. The letter of recommendation said this, while working with Mr. Smith, I've always found him working studiously and sincerely at his table without gossiping with colleagues in the office. He seldom wastes his time on unusual things. Uh, given a job, he always finishes the given assignment in time. He's always deeply engrossed in his official work and can never be found chit-chatting in the canteen. He's absolutely no... Uh, he has absolutely no vanity in spite of his high accomplishment and profound knowledge of his field. I think he can easily be classed as outstanding and should on no account be dispensed with. I strongly feel that Mr. Smith should be pushed to accept promotion and a proposal to management be sent away as soon as possible. And it said, regards, branch manager. But a second note was attached to the report and it said this, Mr. Smith was present when I was writing the report mailed to you today. <laughs> Kindly read only the odd numbered lines for my true assessment of him. <laughs> so here's the odd numbered lines. <laughs> While working with Mr. Smith, I've always found him gossiping with colleagues in the office. <laughs> he seldom finishes the given assignment in time. He's always found chit-chatting in the canteen. He has absolutely no, no, no knowledge of his field. I think he can easily be dispensed with. <laughs> I strongly feel that Mr. Smith should be sent away as soon as possible. <laughs> I just found that to be rather amusing what he did with that. But Paul mentions that he says, do, you know, do I need to have letters of recommendation? Uh, Obviously, he didn't have to have that. Uh, starting in verse 1, are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts. You know, there were apparently those who didn't believe that Paul had the authority of an apostle. Uh, as I've said before, they had written, written an angry letter to Paul after he wrote first, his first letter to them. And apparently that, uh, that letter actually existed in history and people saw it, but it no longer exists, but uh, that's why he had to write this second letter to explain some of the things that he talked about in the first letter. But, you know, Paul was the one who started the church at Corinth. How easily, easily people forget what happened in the past, especially when false teachers try to usurp the authority of the Lord and his apostles. You know, <clears throat> I'm not calling us apostles, but my mother and father went to out to the island of Palau in 1962. And at that time, there were still villages who had never heard the gospel. 
and we traveled to them and uh, preached the gospel, and many people got saved, and they started churches. Um, but now I'm looking at what's going on, and I'm very sad because people have come in and taken over the churches out in Micronesia who really shouldn't be doing that, and they're teaching false doctrine. Well, Paul does not need letters of recommendation from anybody. That's because the Corinthian church, uh, you know, uh, witnessed the proof of Paul's teaching and authority. And Paul is simply reminding them of that. The letter of recommendation is a stamp of approval from the Lord on Paul's ministry and is written by the Holy Spirit in the hearts of those Christians who are living in obedience to the Lord. When Paul says, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts, this is also a reference to the fact that as a born-again, spirit-filled believer, we're no longer condemned by the law written on tablets of stone, because Jesus Christ fulfilled the whole law for us. But now Christ is writing his law, the law of grace, which is love, on our hearts. That's the wonderful thing. You remember we studied in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. <clears throat> for it's written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Romans 8.2, because through Jesus, Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 10.4, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Galatians 6.2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If we love one another, love the Lord our God and love one another. John 1.17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law of Christ is being written on the hearts of those truly born again, not by ink or by chiseling stone, but by the spirit, not on stone, but by on our hearts. Because of that, we have a witness within us as to who is a true teacher and who is a false teacher. If we listen to our conscience guided by the Holy Spirit, and learn from his word. Those are the three things we need to employ. First of all, listen to, listen to your conscience. Second, second of all, allow the Holy Spirit, your teacher, to guide you into all truth. And make sure that you're deep, digging deep into the word of God, because that's got the answers. That's how the Lord speaks to us. Verse 4. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He's made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. God gives us the ability to discern and minister the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Did you know you have that ability? You do as a born-again Christian. We can be confident of God's promises, not because we're competent in ourselves, but because our competence, our ability to know the difference between right and wrong, false teachers and true teachers, comes from God whose spirit lives within us. Paul reminds them that it's not his own competence that commends him or authorizes him to do the apostolic work he's been doing. But it's God. God is the one who authorizes him. Paul is also addressing the fact that he did not come to them preaching the law, but preaching grace. The law condemns, but grace gives life through the Spirit. Paul had already stated to the Galatians that those who preached the law, trying to add it to the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ, were an abomination. 
He said this in Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I, I'm astounded that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody's preached to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. The true gospel of grace, which Paul preached, also testified to his calling from Jesus Christ. A different gospel is one of the most obvious marks of a false teacher. And of course, we'll look into that much more later in the study. But for now, 2 Corinthians 11, 4, for if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit, from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. We shouldn't put up with that. We should not put up with people teaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Verse 7, now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Wow, great thought. For what was glorious has what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? I'll never forget, I went to a conference uh, back in 1969 when we were on our way back to uh, Micronesia. We went through Europe and India, etc back and we ended up going back to the Philippines to go to high school. And uh, we went to a conference up in Northern Germany. And there were a few people there who could not speak English at all. There was one Chinese guy. And, but I just, I'll never forget. I was like, what was I, maybe 16 years old, walking down the path. And this guy was walking toward us. And I'm telling you, it was like there was a light shining from his face. This guy was, you could tell, he was a Christian a mile away. And that always impacted me. You know, do I have that kind of witness with people? Can they see the love of Christ and the Holy Spirit living in me? Well, the Ten Commandments came from the hand of God written in stone. We know that. Uh, Deuteronomy 9.10, the Lord gave me two stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. On them were all the commandments the Lord proclaimed to you on the mountain out of the fire on the day of the assembly. And Exodus 34.30, when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant. And they were afraid to come near him. If the presence of God could make Moses' face shine, will not the presence of the Lord by his spirit in the church and in individual Christians be even more glorious? Why? Because the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. And the new law of Christ supersedes the Mosaic law. The law condemned men. But the ministry of reconciliation through Christ that brings imputed righteousness to those who believe is even more glorious. In fact, the law, in comparison to the law of Christ, which is love through grace, is no glory at all. The glory that comes with Christ will not fade away, 
as the glory faded away from the face of Moses, and he wore a veil because it was fading away. There's no comparison between the law, which only served to prove to men that they were sinners, and the gospel, which proves to men that though they are sinners, Christ died in their place to fulfill the law and pay our penalty for, for us, to glorify the Father, the Father glorifying the Son, and the Son bringing all those who believe in him to glory through the Holy Spirit. Verse 12, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Remember how when Christ was crucified, the veil was torn in two. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You know, this is a, a profound truth. Those who are truly born-again Christians have a glory that does not fade away as the glory eventually did from the face of Moses. But those who continue in the law, it is as if they have a veil over their understanding. Only in Christ can they, number one, understand what the law means, and number two, be set free from it. The minds of those who still live under the law have been made dull, and the law is of no use to them, particularly since they can never live up to the requirements of the law. Romans 3.10, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. The law today looks like Moses did when he wore a veil to hide the fading glory from his face. The glory of the law has faded with the coming of Christ, who is the glory, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles also. Only Christ can remove the veil from the hearts of the Jews who follow the law. The Jews must turn to the Lord and believe that he is the Messiah in order for the veil of the law to be taken away from their hearts. Only then can they experience the freedom Christ gives those who are born again in the spirit. Because where the spirit of the Lord dwells, there is true freedom. Those who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ are like Moses without his veil but greater because the glory we have is the indwelling spirit. The Holy Spirit is our teacher, and we are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. John 14, 26, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. That means we're being sanctified <clears throat> and in the process of being glorified. Did you know you're in the process of being glorified? Romans 8, 23 through 30. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among the brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. God's glory shines through those who are committed to him and to the law of Christ, which is love. The Lord is the Spirit. When you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you have the Lord. As you walk with him, 
the glory increases and he is in the process of transforming you into his likeness, which is the likeness of his character, the likeness of his spirit. What a wonderful message from Paul. What a wonderful thing. We all can radiate the, the glory of the Lord through our lives. If we are willing to stand up for him and witness for him and be, you know, be who we should be. So uh, I want to thank those who are, who've been on the uh, live stream today. Uh, thank you all for being here, obviously. And I'm going to open it up here pretty quick and we can uh, 